Уважаемый Владимир Владимирович, уважаемые коллеги, мы... Dear Vladimir Vladimirovich, dear colleagues, we are always glad to see you at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Allow me on behalf of our entire team to welcome you to another meeting. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for this concerns both our professional activities and the issues of providing the ministries, our embassies and consulates general with everything necessary for the successful resolution of the tasks set. I would also like to note the presence of colleagues from the presidential administration here. The government, the Federal Assembly, executive authorities, we are invariably committed to the closest interaction and coordination in implementing a unified foreign policy course, which is determined by the President of Russia and is outlined in the foreign policy concept of our country. You signed the latest version of the concept in March of last year. Guided by the strategic guidelines contained in it, we are actively working to strengthen our positions on the international stage, ensure security, and create the most favorable external conditions for development. As a priority, we are increasing ties with the countries of the global majority, the global south, and the global east. And accordingly, we are redistributing our material and human resources directing them to the areas that are most in demand under the new geopolitical conditions. I also want to say that we are actively assisting in establishing external relations for Crimea, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, and the Zaporizhia and Kherson regions. For these purposes, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has already established its offices in Donetsk and Luhansk and strengthened the capabilities of the office in Simferopol. I am confident that today's meeting will help to specify all the directions of our practical work on the international stage. Allow me to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome all of you. At the beginning of our meeting, I want to thank you for your hard work in the interests of Russia and our people. We last met in this broad composition in November 2021. Since then, many fateful events have occurred, both in the country and in the world. Therefore, I consider it important to assess the current situation in global and regional affairs, as well as to set corresponding tasks for the Foreign Policy Department. All of them are subordinated to the main goal, creating conditions for the sustainable development of the country ensuring its security and improving well-being. Working in this direction, in today's difficult and rapidly changing realities, requires even greater concentration of efforts, initiative and persistence from all of us. We must not only respond to current challenges, but also shape our long-term agenda. Together with our partners, we propose to discuss within the framework of an open and constructive dialogue the options for solving those fundamental issues that concern not only us, but the entire global community. I repeat, the world is changing rapidly. Things will no longer be the same in global politics, economics, or technological competition. More and more states are striving to strengthen their sovereignty, self-sufficiency, national and cultural identity. Countries of the global South and East are coming to the forefront, and the role of Africa and Latin America is growing. We have always, even since Soviet times, emphasized the importance of these regions of the world, but today the dynamics are completely different. This is becoming noticeable. The pace of transformation in Eurasia has also noticeably accelerated, where a number of large-scale integration projects are actively being implemented. It is precisely on the basis of the new political and economic reality that the contours of a multipolar and multilateral world order are being formed today. This is an objective process. It reflects the cultural and civilizational diversity that, despite all attempts at artificial unification, is organically inherent to humanity. 
These profound systemic changes inspire optimism and hope. The affirmation of the principles of multipolarity and multilateralism in international affairs, including respect for international law and broad representation, allows us to jointly solve the most complex problems for the common good. This helps to build mutually beneficial relationships and cooperation among sovereign states in the interests of the well-being and security of peoples. This vision of the future resonates with the aspirations of the absolute majority of countries in the world, and we see this, among other things, in the growing interest in the work of such a universal association as BRICS, which is based on a special culture of trustful dialogue, sovereign equality of participants, and mutual respect. Within the framework of the Russian chairmanship this year, we will facilitate the smooth integration of new BRICS participants into the working structures of the association. I ask the government and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to continue substantive work and dialogue with partners to arrive at the BRICS summit in Kazan in October with a substantial set of agreed decisions that will set the vector of our cooperation in politics and security, economy and finance, science, culture, sports and humanitarian ties. Overall, I believe that the potential of BRICS will allow it to eventually become one of the core regulatory institutions of a multipolar world order. In this regard, I would like to note that the international discussion on the parameters of interaction between states in a multipolar world and the democratization of the entire system of international relations is already underway. Together with my colleagues from the Commonwealth of Independent States, we have agreed upon and adopted a joint document on international relations in a multipolar world. We have invited partners to discuss this topic on other international platforms, primarily in the CO and BRICS. We are interested in ensuring that this dialogue receives serious development within the walls of the UN, including on such a fundamental and vital topic for everyone as the creation of an indivisible security system. In other words, the assertion in world affairs of the principle that the security of some cannot be ensured at the expense of the security of others. Let me remind you that at the end of the 20th century, after the end of the acute military ideological confrontation, the world community had a unique chance to build a reliable and fair order in the field of security. For this, not much was required. A simple ability to listen to the opinions of all interested parties and a mutual willingness to take them into account. Our country was set on such constructive work. However, another approach prevailed. Western powers, led by the United States, considered that they had won the Cold War and had the right to independently determine how the world should be arranged. The practical expression of such a worldview became the project of unlimited expansion of the North Atlantic bloc in space and time. Although there were, of course, other ideas on how to ensure security in Europe. But, to our legitimate questions, they responded with excuses in the spirit that no one intends to attack Russia, and NATO expansion is not directed against Russia. The promises made to the Soviet Union, and then to Russia in the late 80s and early 90s, about not including new members in the bloc, were calmly forgotten. And if they were remembered, it was with a smirk, referring to the fact that these assurances were verbal and therefore not binding. We consistently pointed out the erroneous course chosen by the Western elites, both in the 90s and later. Not just criticized, warned, but offered options, constructive solutions, emphasized the importance of developing a mechanism for European and global security that would suit everyone. I want to emphasize this, everyone. A simple listing of the initiatives that Russia has put forward over the years would take more than one paragraph. Let's at least recall the idea of a European security treaty, which we proposed back in 2008. 
The same topics were raised in the memorandum of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was handed over to the USA and NATO in December 2021. But all our numerous attempts to reason with our interlocutors, explanations, exhortations, warnings and requests from our side received no response at all. Western countries, being confident not only in their righteousness, but also in their power and ability to impose anything they want on the rest of the world, simply ignored other opinions. At best, they assumed to discuss secondary issues that essentially resolved little or topics beneficial exclusively to the West. Meanwhile, it quickly became clear that the Western scheme, proclaimed as the only correct one for ensuring security and prosperity in Europe and the world, does not actually work. Let us recall the tragedy in the Balkans. The internal problems accumulated in the former Yugoslavia sharply escalated due to crude external interference. Even then, the main principle of Western-style diplomacy manifested itself in all its glory, deeply flawed and fruitless in resolving complex internal conflicts. Namely, to blame one of the parties, which for some reason they do not particularly like, for all the sins and to unleash all political, informational and military power, economic sanctions and restrictions on it. Subsequently, the same approaches were applied in different parts of the world. We know this very well. Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and so on. And they never brought anything but the aggravation of existing problems, the broken lives of millions of people, the destruction of entire states, the spread of humanitarian and social disasters, and terrorist enclaves. In essence, no country in the world is insured against joining this sad list. Now the West is aggressively trying to interfere in the affairs of the Middle East. They once monopolized this direction. The result is clear and obvious to everyone today. The South Caucasus, Central Asia. Two years ago, at the NATO summit in Madrid, it was announced that the alliance would address security issues not only in the Euro-Atlantic, but also in the Asia-Pacific region. It is obvious that this is an attempt to increase pressure on the countries of the region, whose development they have decided to restrain. As is known, our country, Russia, is at the top of this list. I would also like to remind you that it was Washington that undermined strategic stability by unilaterally withdrawing from the treaties on missile defense and the elimination of intermediate range and shorter range missiles, as well as the Open Skies Treaty. Together with their NATO satellites, they destroyed the system of confidence building measures and arms control in the European space that had been built over decades. Ultimately, the selfishness and arrogance of Western states have led to the current extremely dangerous state of affairs. We have come unacceptably close to the point of no return. Calls to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia, which possesses the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons, demonstrate the extreme recklessness of Western politicians. They either do not understand the scale of the threat they themselves are creating, or they are simply obsessed with a belief in their own impunity and exceptionalism. Both can lead to tragedy. Clearly, we are witnessing the collapse of the Euro-Atlantic security system. Today, it simply does not exist. It needs to be essentially recreated. All this requires us together with partners and all interested countries, and there are many of them, to work out our own options for ensuring security in Eurasia and to propose them for broad international discussion. This is precisely the directive given in the address to the Federal Assembly. The point is to formulate, in the foreseeable future, a framework of equal and indivisible security, mutually beneficial, equitable cooperation and development on the Eurasian continent.
What needs to be done for this, and on what principles? First, it is necessary to establish a dialogue with all potential participants of such a future security system. To begin with, I ask to work out the necessary issues with states open to constructive interaction with Russia. During the recent visit to the People's Republic of China, we discussed this issue with Chinese President Xi Jinping. We noted that the Russian proposal does not contradict, but rather complements and fully aligns with the main principles of the Chinese initiative in the field of global security. Second, it is important to proceed from the fact that the future security architecture is open to all Eurasian countries that wish to participate in its creation. For everyone, it means that European NATO countries, undoubtedly as well. We live on the same continent, no matter what happens, geography cannot be changed. One way or another, we will have to coexist and work together. Yes, currently, Russia's relations with a number of European countries have deteriorated. Moreover, it has been emphasized many times, not through our fault. The anti-Russian propaganda campaign, in which quite high-ranking European figures participate, is accompanied by speculations that Russia is allegedly planning to attack Europe. I have said this many times, and there is no need to repeat it multiple times in this hall. We all understand that this is absolute nonsense. It is just a justification for the arms race. In this regard, allow me a brief digression. The danger for Europe does not come from Russia. The main threat to Europeans lies in the critical and ever-increasing, now practically total dependence on the United States in military, political, technological, ideological and informational spheres. Europe is increasingly being pushed to the sidelines of global economic development, plunged into the chaos of migration and other acute problems, deprived of international subjectivity and cultural identity. Sometimes it seems that the ruling European politicians and representatives of the Euro bureaucracy are more afraid of falling out of favor with Washington than losing the trust of their own people, their own citizens. The recent elections to the European Parliament also demonstrate this. European politicians swallow humiliation, rudeness and scandals involving surveillance of European leaders, while the USA simply uses them for its own interests. They force them to buy their expensive gas, which by the way, costs three to four times more in Europe than in the USA. Now, for example, they are demanding that European countries increase arms supplies to Ukraine. The demands are constant, here and there. And they impose sanctions against economic operators in Europe, without any hesitation. Now, they are forcing them to increase arms supplies to Ukraine and expand their artillery shell production capacities. Listen, who will need these shells when the conflict in Ukraine ends? How can this ensure Europe's military security? It's unclear. The USA is investing in military technologies, specifically in the technologies of tomorrow. Space, modern drones, strike systems based on new physical principles. That is, in those areas that will determine the nature of armed struggle in the future, and therefore the military political potential of states and their positions in the world. And Europe is now being assigned a different role. Invest money where we need it. But this does not increase Europe's potential. Well, to hell with them, maybe it's good for us. But essentially, that's how it is. If Europe wants to maintain itself as one of the independent centers of global development and cultural civilizational poles of the planet, it undoubtedly needs to be in good, friendly relations with Russia. And we, most importantly, are ready for this. This simple and obvious fact was well understood by politicians of truly pan-European and global scale, patriots of their countries and peoples, who thought in historical categories, not bystanders who follow someone else's will and prompts. Charles de Gaulle spoke a lot about this in the post-war years. 
I also well remember how in 1991, during a conversation in which I personally participated, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl emphasized the importance of the partnership between Europe and Russia, hoping that this legacy would sooner or later be revisited by new generations of European politicians. As for the United States itself, the unceasing attempts of the liberal globalist elites currently in power there to spread their ideology around the world by any means and to maintain their imperial status and dominance only further exhaust the country and lead it to degradation. This is in clear contradiction with the true interests of the American people. If it weren't for this dead-end path, aggressive messianism mixed with a belief in their own chosenness and exclusivity, international relations would have long been stabilized. To promote the idea of a Eurasian security system, it is necessary to significantly intensify the dialogue process between the multilateral organizations already operating in Eurasia. The discussion is primarily about the Union State, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We see the prospect that other influential Eurasian associations from Southeast Asia to the Middle East will join these processes in the future. We believe that the time has come to start a broad discussion on a new system of bilateral and multilateral collective security guarantees in Eurasia. In the long term, this should lead to the gradual reduction of the military presence of external powers in the Eurasian region. We understand, of course, that in the current situation, this thesis may seem unrealistic. However, that is now. But if we build a reliable security system in the future, there simply will be no need for the presence of external military contingents. By and large, to be honest, there is no need for it today either. It's an occupation, that's all. Ultimately, we believe that the states and regional structures of Eurasia should themselves determine the specific areas of cooperation in the field of joint security. They should also build a system of functioning institutions and mechanisms of agreement that would genuinely serve the achievement of common goals of stability and development. In this regard, we support the initiative of our Belarusian friends to develop a program document, the Charter of Multipolarity and Diversity in the 21st Century. It can formulate not only the framework principles of the Eurasian architecture based on the fundamental norms of international law, but also, in a broader sense, a strategic vision of the essence of the nature of multipolarity and multilateralism as a new system of international relations, replacing the Western-centric world. I consider it important and ask to thoroughly work out such a document with our partners and all interested states. I would add that when discussing such complex, comprehensive issues, it is certainly necessary to have the widest possible representation, taking into account different approaches. An important part of the Eurasian system of security and development should undoubtedly be issues of economy, social well-being, integration and mutually beneficial cooperation. Addressing common issues such as overcoming poverty, inequality, climate, ecology, and developing mechanisms to respond to pandemic threats and crises in the global economy is all important. The West, through its actions, not only undermined military political stability in the world with sanctions and trade wars, but also discredited and weakened key market institutions by using the IMF and the World Bank manipulating the climate agenda and restraining the development of the global south. Losing in competition, even by the rules that the West itself wrote, it resorts to prohibitive barriers and all kinds of protectionism. Thus, the United States has effectively abandoned the World Trade Organization as a regulator of international trade. Everything is planned. 
Moreover, they are pressuring not only competitors, but also their own satellites. Just look at how they are now draining the European economies, which are teetering on the brink of recession. Western countries have frozen part of Russia's assets and currency reserves. Now they are thinking about how to provide at least some legal basis to finally appropriate them. But despite all the legal chicanery, theft will undoubtedly remain theft. And it will not go unpunished, on the other hand. But the issue is even deeper. By stealing Russian assets, they will take another step towards destroying the system they themselves created, which for many decades ensured their prosperity, allowing them to consume more than they earn. Through debts and obligations to attract money from all over the world. Now it is becoming obvious to all countries and companies that their assets and reserves are far from safe, both in the legal and economic sense of the word. The next in line for expropriation by the US and the West could be anyone. Foreign states and sovereign funds may be at risk. Distrust in the financial system based on Western Reserve currencies, is already growing. There is a noticeable outflow of funds from securities and debt obligations of Western states, as well as some European banks, which until recently were considered absolutely reliable places to store capital. We are acting correctly. I believe that we need to seriously intensify the formation of effective and safe bilateral and multilateral foreign economic mechanisms, alternative to those controlled by the West. This includes expanding settlements in national currencies, creating independent payment systems, and building production and distribution chains, bypassing channels blocked or compromised by the West. And of course, it is necessary to continue efforts to develop international transport corridors in Eurasia, a continent for which Russia is the natural geographic core. Through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I instruct to maximize assistance in developing international agreements in all these areas. They are extremely important for strengthening economic cooperation, both for our country and our partners. Thus, a new impetus should be given to the construction of a large European partnership, which can become the socio-economic basis of a new system of indivisible security in Europe. Dear colleagues, the essence of our proposals is to form such a system in which all states would be confident in their own security. Then we can truly approach the resolution of numerous conflicts that exist today in a constructive manner. The problem of the deficit of security and mutual trust concerns not only the Eurasian continent. Growing tension is observed everywhere. The extent to which the world is interconnected and interdependent is something we see constantly. A tragic example for all of us is the Ukrainian crisis, the consequences of which are felt across the entire planet. But I want to say right away, the crisis related to Ukraine is not a conflict between two states, not a conflict between two peoples caused by war. If that were the case, there is no doubt that Russians and Ukrainians, who are united by a common history and culture, spiritual values, millions of kinship, family and human ties, would have found a way to justly resolve any issues and disagreements. But the situation is different. The roots of the conflict are not in bilateral relations. The events in Ukraine are a direct result of global and European developments at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. With that aggressive, brazen and absolutely adventurous policy that the West has been pursuing all these years long, before the special military operation began. These elites of Western countries, as I mentioned today, after the end of the Cold War, took a course towards further geopolitical restructuring of the world, towards the creation and imposition of the notorious rules-based order, in which strong, sovereign and self-sufficient states simply do not fit.
hence the policy of containing our country. The goals of this policy are already openly declared by some figures in the USA and Europe. Today they talk about the notorious decolonization of Russia. Essentially, this is an attempt to provide an ideological basis for the dismemberment of our motherland along national lines. In fact, the dismemberment of the Soviet Union and Russia has been discussed for a long time. Everyone sitting in this hall knows this well. Implementing this strategy, Western countries have taken a course towards absorbing and militarily and politically mastering territories close to us. There have been five, and now six waves of NATO expansion. They tried to turn Ukraine into their stronghold, to make it anti-Russia. To achieve these goals, they invested money, resources, bought politicians and entire parties, rewrote history and educational programs, nurtured and cultivated neo-Nazi and radical groups. They did everything to undermine our interstate connections, to divide and set our peoples against each other. The southeast of Ukraine hindered the implementation of such a policy even more brazenly and unceremoniously, a territory that for centuries was part of the greater historical Russia. People lived there, and still live there, who, even after the declaration of Ukraine's independence in 1991, advocated for good, very close relations with our country. People, both Russians and Ukrainians, representatives of different nationalities, were united by the Russian language, culture, traditions, and historical memory. The position, mood, interests, and voices of these millions of people living in the Southeast simply had to be taken into account and considered by the then Ukrainian presidents and politicians who were vying for this post and relied on the votes of these voters. But, using these votes, they then maneuvered, hedged, lied a lot, and talked about the so-called European choice. They did not dare to completely break with Russia because the southeast of Ukraine had a different stance. This could not be ignored. Such duality has always been inherent in Ukrainian authorities throughout all the years after the recognition of independence. The West, of course, saw this. It had long understood the problems that existed there and could be stirred up. It raised the restraining significance of the southeastern factor, as well as the fact that no amount of long-term propaganda could fundamentally change the situation. Of course, much was done, but it was difficult to fundamentally change the situation. It was not possible to distort the historical identity of the consciousness of the majority of people in southeastern Ukraine, to eradicate from them, including the younger generations, a positive attitude towards Russia and a sense of our historical unity. And so they decided to act with force again, simply to break the people in the southeast, to disregard their opinion. For this, they arranged, organized, and financed. Of course, they took advantage of the difficulties and complexities of Ukraine's internal political situation. But still, they consistently and purposefully prepared armed state coups. A wave of pogroms, violence, and murders swept through the cities of Ukraine. Power in Kiev was finally seized and usurped by radicals. Their aggressive nationalist slogans, including the rehabilitation of Nazi collaborators, were elevated to the level of state ideology. The course towards the abolition of the Russian language in state and public spheres continued. Pressure on orthodox believers increased, with interference in church affairs, which eventually led to a schism. No one seems to notice this interference as if it is supposed to be that way. Try to do something similar somewhere else. There would be so much noise that your ears would fall off. But there, it's allowed because it's against Russia. Millions of residents of Ukraine, primarily from its eastern regions, opposed the coup. They were threatened with reprisals and terror. First and foremost, the new authorities in Kyiv began preparing a strike against the Russian-speaking Crimea, which as you know was transferred from the RSFSR to Ukraine in 1954, 
with violations of all norms, laws and procedures, even those in effect in the Soviet Union at that time. In this situation, of course, we could not abandon or leave the Crimeans and Sevastopol residents without protection. They made their choice, and in March 2014, as is known, the historic reunification of Crimea and Sevastopol with Russia took place. In Kharkiv, Kherson, Odessa, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk and Mariupol, peaceful protests against the coup began to be suppressed. Terror was unleashed by the Kiev regime and nationalist groups. It is probably unnecessary to recall, as everyone already remembers well, what happened in these regions. In May 2014, Referendums on the status of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics were held, in which the absolute majority of residents voted for independence and sovereignty. Immediately the question arises, could people express their will in this way? Could they declare their independence? Well, those sitting in this hall understand that, of course, they could. They had every right and basis for this, in accordance with international law, including the right of peoples to self-determination. You don't need a reminder, but nevertheless, since the media is working, I will say. Article 1, paragraph 2 of the United Nations Charter grants this right. I will remind you in this context of the notorious Kosovo precedent. This has been discussed many times already. I will say it again now, a precedent that Western countries created themselves. In a similar situation, they recognized the legitimacy of Kosovo's secession from Serbia, which took place in 2008. Then followed the well-known decision of the International Court of Justice, which on July 22, 2010, based on Article 1, Paragraph 2 of the Charter of the United Nations, ruled I quote, no general prohibition on unilateral declarations of independence may be derived from the practice of the Security Council. And the next quote, general international law does not contain any applicable prohibition on declarations of independence. Well, it means that it was written there that the parts of the country that decided to declare their independence were not obliged to appeal to the central authorities of their former state. Everything was written in black and white. So, did these republics of Donetsk and Luhansk have the right to declare their independence? Of course, yes. The question cannot be considered otherwise. What did the regime in Kiev do in this situation? Completely ignored the people's choice and unleashed a full-scale war against the new independent states, the People's Republics of Donbas, using aviation, artillery and tanks. Bombings and shelling of peaceful cities began, acts of intimidation. And what happened next? The residents of Donbass took up arms to protect their lives, their homes, their rights, and their legitimate interests. In the West, there is a constant narrative that Russia started the war as part of a special military operation, that it is the aggressor, and therefore its territory can be struck using Western weapon systems. Ukraine is allegedly defending itself and can do so. I want to emphasize once again, Russia did not start the war. It was the Kiev regime, I repeat. After the residents of part of Ukraine declared their independence in accordance with international law, that began and continues the hostilities. This is aggression. If we recognize the right of these peoples, who lived in these territories, to declare their independence, then how can this be called anything else? This is aggression. And those who have been helping the military machine of the Kiev regime all these years are accomplices of the aggressor. Back in 2014, the residents of Donbass did not submit. The militia units held out, repelled the punitive forces, and then pushed them back from Donetsk and Luhansk. We hoped that this would sober up those who unleashed this carnage. To stop the bloodshed, Russia called for negotiations, and they began with the participation of Kiev and representatives of the Donbas republics, with the assistance of Russia, Germany and France. The talks were difficult, 
But nevertheless, the Minsk agreements were concluded in 2015. We took their implementation very seriously. We hoped that we could resolve the situation within the framework of the peace process and international law. We expected that this would lead to the consideration of the legitimate interests and demands of Donbass, the enshrinement of a special status for these regions in the constitution, and the fundamental rights of the people living there while preserving the territorial unity of Ukraine. We were ready for this. We were ready to persuade the people living in these territories to resolve issues in this way. We repeatedly proposed various compromises and solutions, but everything was ultimately rejected. The Minsk agreements were simply thrown into the trash by Kyiv. As representatives of the Ukrainian leadership later admitted, none of the articles of these documents suited them. They just lied and twisted things as much as they could. <coughs> the former Chancellor of Germany and the former President of France, effectively co-authors and guarantors of the Minsk agreements, later openly admitted that their implementation was never planned. They just needed to talk the situation to death to buy time for building up Ukrainian armed formations, pumping them with weapons and equipment. They simply deceived us. Instead of a real peace process, instead of a policy of reintegration and national reconciliation, which they loved to talk about in Kyiv, Donbass was shelled for eight years, subjected to terrorist attacks, murders, and the harshest blockade was organized. All these years, the residents of Donbass, women, children, the elderly, were declared second-class people, subhumans, and were threatened with reprisals. They said, we will come and settle scores with each one of you. What is this, if not genocide, in the center of Europe in the 21st century? And Europe and the USA pretended that nothing was happening, that no one noticed anything. At the end of 2021, at the beginning of 2022, the Minsk process was finally buried. Buried by Kyiv and its Western patrons. And a massive strike on Donbass was again planned. A large group of the Ukrainian armed forces was preparing to launch a new offensive on Luhansk and Donetsk. Of course, with ethnic cleansing and enormous human casualties, hundreds of thousands of refugees, we had to prevent this catastrophe, protect the people. We could not make any other decision. Russia finally recognized the Donetsk and Luhansk people's republics. After all, we had not recognized them for eight years. We were still hoping to negotiate. The result is now known. And on February 21st, 2022, we signed a treaty of friendship and mutual assistance with these republics. The question is, did the People's Republics have the right to ask us for support if we recognize their independence? And did we have the right to recognize their independence high, just as they had the right to declare their sovereignty in accordance with the articles and decisions of the International Court of Justice that I mentioned? Did they have the right to declare independence they did. But if they had such a right and exercised it, then we had the right to sign a treaty with them. And we did. Moreover, I repeat, in full accordance with international law and Article 51 of the UN Charter. At the same time, we called on the Kiev authorities to withdraw their troops from Donbass. I can tell you, we had contacts, and we immediately told them, withdraw the troops from there, and everything will end. This proposal was immediately rejected, simply ignored, although it provided a real opportunity to resolve the issue peacefully. On February 24th, 2022, Russia was forced to announce the start of a special military operation, addressing the citizens of Russia and the residents of the Donetsk and Luhansk republics, as well as the Ukrainian society, the goal of this operation was then outlined. To protect people in Donbass, restore peace, carry out the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, and thereby remove the threat from our state, restore the balance in the security sphere in Europe.
At the same time, we continued to consider achieving these goals through political and diplomatic methods of priority. I would like to remind you that at the very first stage of the special military operation, our country entered into negotiations with representatives of the Kiev regime. They initially took place in Belarus, then in Turkey. We tried to convey our main message, respect the choice of Donbass, the will of the people living there, withdraw the troops, stop the shelling of peaceful cities and towns, nothing more is needed. The remaining issues will be resolved later. The response was no, we will fight. It is obvious that this was the command from the Western masters. And now I will also speak about this. At that time, in February-March 2022, our troops, as is known, approached Kyiv. There are many speculations about this, both in Ukraine and in the West, both then and now. What do I want to say about this? <coughs> Our forces were indeed stationed near Kyiv, and the military departments and the security bloc had different proposals regarding our possible further actions. But there was no political decision to storm the three million strong city, no matter what anyone says or imagines. Essentially, it was an operation to compel the Ukrainian regime to peace. The troops were there to push the Ukrainian side towards negotiations, to try to find acceptable solutions, and thereby end the war that Kyiv had started against Donbass back in 2014. Resolve issues that pose a threat to the security of our country, to the security of Russia. And strangely enough, as a result, it was indeed possible to reach agreements that were generally acceptable to both Moscow and Kyiv. These agreements were put on paper and initialed in Istanbul by the head of the Ukrainian negotiating delegation. This means that such a resolution of the issue suited the Kiev authorities. The document was called the Treaty on Permanent Neutrality and Security Guarantees of Ukraine. It was of a compromise nature, but its key points met our fundamental requirements. They addressed the tasks declared as primary at the start of the special military operation. Including, as strange as it may seem, I draw attention to the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. We also managed to find complex solutions. They were difficult, but found. Specifically, it was meant that a Ukrainian law would be adopted banning Nazi ideology and any of its manifestations. Everything is written there. In addition, Ukraine, in exchange for international security guarantees, would limit the size of its armed forces, commit to not joining military alliances, not allowing foreign military bases on its territory, not deploying their contingents, and not conducting military exercises on its territory. Everything is written on paper. For our part, also understanding Ukraine's security concerns, we agreed that Ukraine, while not formally joining NATO, would receive guarantees practically equivalent to those enjoyed by members of this alliance. This was not an easy decision for us, but we recognize the legitimacy of Ukraine's demands for ensuring its security and, in principle, did not object to the formulations proposed by Kyiv. These were the formulations proposed by Kyiv, and we generally did not object to them, understanding that the main thing was to stop the bloodshed and the war in Donbass. On March 29, 2022, we withdrew our troops from Kyiv, as we were assured that it was necessary to create the necessary conditions for the completion of the political negotiation process, and that it was impossible for one of the parties to sign such agreements, as our Western colleagues said, with a gun to their head. Fine, we agreed to that as well. However, immediately, the day after the withdrawal of Russian troops from Kyiv, the leadership of Ukraine suspended its participation in the negotiation process, staged the well-known provocation in Bucha, and refused the prepared version of the agreement. I think it is clear today why this dirty provocation was needed, to somehow explain the rejection of the results that were achieved during the negotiations. 
the path to peace was again rejected. This was done, as we now know, at the behest of Western curators, including the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. During his visit to Kiev, it was explicitly stated, no agreements, Russia must be defeated on the battlefield, achieving its strategic defeat and victory. They began to intensively pump Ukraine with weapons. They started talking about the need to inflict, as I just reminded, a strategic defeat on us. And some time later, as everyone knows well, the president of Ukraine issued a decree. Forbade his representatives, and even himself, from conducting any negotiations with Moscow. This episode of our attempt to resolve the issue, by peaceful means, again ended in nothing. By the way, on the topic of negotiations, now I would like to disclose another episode to this audience. I have not spoken about this publicly before, but some of those present are aware of it. After the Russian army occupied parts of the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, many Western politicians offered their mediation for a peaceful resolution of the conflict. One of them was on a working visit to Moscow on March 5, 2022. We accepted his mediation efforts especially since during the conversation he referred to the support of the leaders of Germany and France, as well as high-ranking representatives of the United States. During the conversation, our foreign guest inquired, an interesting episode, he said, if you are helping Donbass, then why are Russian troops in the south of Ukraine, including the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions? The answer was that this was the decision of the Russian general staff in planning the operation. And today, I will add that the idea was to bypass some of the fortified areas that the Ukrainian authorities had built in Donbas over eight years, primarily for the liberation of Mariupol. Then the foreign colleague asked for clarification. A professional person, credit where it's due. Will our troops, the Russian ones, remain in the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, and what will happen to these regions after achieving the goals of the special military operation? To this, I replied, that in general, I do not rule out the preservation of Ukrainian sovereignty over these territories but on the condition that Russia will have a solid land connection with Crimea. That is, Kiev must guarantee the so-called servitude, legally formalized rights of access for Russia to the Crimean Peninsula through the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. This is a crucial political decision. Of course, in the final version, it would not be made unilaterally, but only after consultation with the Security Council and other structures. Also, after discussions with the citizens of our country, and above all, with the residents of the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. Ultimately, that is what we did. We asked the opinions of the people themselves and held referendums. And they acted as the people decided, including in the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, in the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. In March 2022, a negotiation partner reported that he was going to head to Kiev to continue the conversation with colleagues in the Ukrainian capital. We welcome this, as well as attempts to find a peaceful resolution to the conflict, because each day of hostilities meant new casualties and losses. However, in Ukraine, as we later learned, the services of the Western mediator were not accepted. On the contrary, he was accused of taking pro-Russian positions. Quite harshly, I must say, but those are details. Now, as I have already said, the situation has fundamentally changed. The residents of Kherson and Zaporizhia expressed their position during the referendums. The Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, as well as the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, became part of the Russian Federation. There can be no talk of violating our national unity. The will of the people to be with Russia is unshakable. The issue is closed forever and is no longer up for discussion. I want to repeat once again, 
It was the West that prepared and provoked the Ukrainian crisis. And now it is doing everything to prolong this crisis indefinitely, weakening and mutually embittering the peoples of Russia and Ukraine. They are sending new batches of ammunition and weapons. Some European politicians have started talking about the possibility of deploying their regular troops in Ukraine. At the same time, as already noted, it is the current true masters of Ukraine. And unfortunately, it is not the people of Ukraine, but the globalist elites located overseas, who are trying to place the burden of making unpopular decisions on the Ukrainian executive power, including further lowering the conscription age. Currently, as is known, it is 25 years. The next stage could be 23, then 20, or immediately 18. Then, of course, they will get rid of those figures who will make these unpopular decisions under Western pressure and discard them as unnecessary, placing all the responsibility on them. They will replace them with others, also dependent on the West, but not yet with such a tarnished reputation. Perhaps this is the reason behind the idea of cancelling the upcoming presidential elections in Ukraine. Now, those in power will do everything, then they will be removed, and they will continue to do what they deem necessary. In this regard, let me remind you of something that people in Kyiv now prefer not to remember. And in general, the West prefers not to talk about it. What is it about? Back in May 2014, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine ruled that, I quote, the president is elected for five years, regardless of whether he is elected in extraordinary or regular elections. In addition, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine noted that, I quote, the constitutional status of the president does not contain provisions that would establish any term other than the five-year term." End of quote. The court's decision was final and not subject to appeal. All right. What does this mean in relation to today's situation? The presidential term of the previously elected head of Ukraine has expired along with his legitimacy, which cannot be restored by any tricks. I will not go into detail about the background of the decision of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine regarding the presidential term. It is clear that it was related to attempts to legitimize the 2014 coup. Nevertheless, such a verdict exists, and it is a legal fact. It casts doubt on all attempts to justify today's spectacle of cancelling elections. In fact, the current tragic chapter in Ukraine's history began with a forcible seizure of power, as I have already said, an unconstitutional coup in 2014. I repeat, the source of the current Kiev regime is an armed path. And now the circle is complete. Executive power in Ukraine is once again, as in 2014, usurped and held by illegal means. In fact, it is illegitimate. I will say more. The situation with the cancellation of elections is an expression of the true nature of the current Kiev regime, which grew out of the armed coup of 2014. It is tied to it, and there are its roots. By cancelling the elections, they continue to cling to power. These actions are directly prohibited by Article 5 of the Constitution of Ukraine. I quote, The right to determine and change the constitutional order in Ukraine belongs exclusively to the people and cannot be usurped by the state, its bodies, or officials. In addition, such actions fall under Article 109 of the Constitution. The Criminal Code of Ukraine, which specifically addresses the violent alteration or overthrow of the constitutional order, the seizure of state power, as well as conspiracy to commit such actions. In 2014, such usurpation was justified in the name of revolution, and now, by military actions. But the essence of this does not change. Essentially, it is about a conspiracy between the executive power of Ukraine and the leadership of the Vakovna Rada, controlled by the parliamentary majority, aimed at the usurpation of state power. It cannot be called otherwise, and it is a criminal offence under Ukrainian law.
The Constitution of Ukraine does not provide for the possibility of cancelling or postponing presidential elections or extending the president's powers due to martial law, which is currently being referenced. What is in the Ukrainian basic law is that during martial law, elections to the Vokovna Rada can be postponed. This is Article 83 of the country's constitution. So Ukrainian legislation has provided the only exception when the powers of a state authority are extended during martial law and elections are not held and this concerns exclusively the Vakovna Rada. Thus, the status of the Ukrainian parliament as a permanently functioning body under martial law is defined. In other words, it is the Vakovna Rada that is today the legitimate body, unlike the executive power. Ukraine is not a presidential republic, but a parliamentary presidential one. This is the essence. Moreover, the chairman of the Vakovna Rada, acting as the president, is endowed with special powers under Articles 106 and 112, including in the areas of defense, security, and supreme command of the armed forces. Everything is clearly spelled out there. By the way, in the first half of this year, Ukraine concluded a package of bilateral agreements on cooperation in the field of security and long-term support for socially vulnerable states in Europe. Now a similar document has appeared with the USA. But since May 21st of this year, the question of the powers and legitimacy of the Ukrainian representatives who signed such documents has naturally arisen. As they say, it doesn't matter to us, let them sign whatever they want. It is clear that there is a political and propagandistic component here. The United States and its satellites want to support their proxies, giving them weight and legitimacy. Nevertheless, if later in the same United States a serious legal examination of such an agreement is conducted, the question will inevitably arise, who signed these documents and with what authority? It will turn out that all this is a bluff, the agreement is null and void, and the entire structure will collapse. I would also like to remind you that of course, if there is a desire to analyze the situation, one can pretend that everything is normal, but there is nothing normal there. Everything is written in the documents, in the constitution. I would also like to remind you that after the start of the special military operation, the West launched a vigorous and rather unceremonious campaign, trying to isolate Russia on the international stage. Today, it is clear to everyone that this attempt has failed. However, the West has not abandoned its idea of building some semblance of an international anti-Russian coalition and creating the appearance of pressure on Russia. We understand this as well. As you know, they have begun actively promoting the initiative to hold a so-called high-level international conference on peace in Ukraine in Switzerland. Moreover, they plan to hold it immediately after the G7 summit. That is, the group of those who, in fact, ignited the conflict in Ukraine with their policies. What the organizers of the meeting in Switzerland are proposing is just another ploy to distract attention, to swap the cause and effect of the Ukrainian crisis, to lead the discussion down a false path, and to create the appearance of legitimacy for the current government in Ukraine. It is natural that no fundamental issues underlying the current crisis of international security and stability, the true roots of the Ukrainian conflict, are going to be discussed in Switzerland. Despite all attempts to give a respectable appearance to the conference agenda, it can be expected that everything will boil down to general demagogic talk and a new set of accusations against Russia. By the way, it is easy to see that they are trying to involve as many countries as possible and ultimately present it as if Western recipes and rules are shared by the entire international community. Therefore, our country must unconditionally accept them. As you know, 
We were naturally not invited to the meeting in Switzerland. After all, this is not really a negotiation, but an attempt by a group of countries to continue pushing their agenda, deciding issues that directly affect our interests and security at their own discretion. I want to emphasize in this regard, without Russia's participation, without an honest and responsible dialogue with us, it is impossible to reach a peaceful solution in Ukraine and overall global European security. While the West ignores our interests and forbids Kyiv from negotiating, it hypocritically calls on us to engage in some kind of negotiations. This looks simply idiotic. On one hand, they are forbidden to negotiate with us, and on the other hand, we are called to negotiations or hinted that we are refusing them. This is some kind of nonsense. We live in a sort of wonderland. First of all, they should start by giving Kyiv the command to lift the ban on negotiations with Russia. Secondly, we are ready to sit at the negotiating table even tomorrow. We understand all the peculiarities of the legal situation, but there are legitimate authorities there, even according to the constitution. There is someone to negotiate with. Please, we are ready. Our conditions for starting such a conversation are simple and boil down to the following. I would now spend some time to reproduce the entire chain of events once again, so it is clear that what I am about to say is not a matter of today's circumstances. We have always adhered to a certain position, we have always strived for peace. So these conditions are very simple. Ukrainian troops must be completely withdrawn from the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. Moreover, I draw attention to the fact that this means from the entire territory of these regions, within their administrative borders, that existed at the time of their incorporation into Ukraine. As soon as Kyiv announces its readiness for such a decision and begins the actual withdrawal of troops from these regions, as well as officially notifies of the renunciation of plans to join NATO, an order to cease fire and start negotiations will immediately follow from our side. I repeat, we will do this immediately. Naturally, we guarantee the unimpeded and safe withdrawal of Ukrainian units and formations. We would like to hope that such a decision on troop withdrawal, non-aligned status, and the start of dialogue with Russia, on which Ukraine's future depends, will be made independently in Kyiv, based on the prevailing realities and guided by the genuine national interests of the Ukrainian people, and not under Western directives. Although there are, of course, significant doubts about this, Nevertheless, I want to once again say and remind in this regard, I said that I would like to go over the chronology of events once more. Let's take the time to do this. So, during the events on Maidan in Kyiv in 2013-2014, Russia repeatedly offered its assistance in the constitutional resolution of the crisis, which was actually organized from outside. Let's return to the chronology of events at the end of February 2014. On February 18th, armed clashes began in Kyiv, provoked by the opposition. A number of buildings, including the City Hall and the House of Trade Unions, were set on fire. On February 20th, unknown snipers opened fire on protesters and law enforcement officers. Those who were preparing the armed coup did everything to push the situation further towards violence and radicalization. The people who were on the streets of Kyiv during those days, expressing dissatisfaction with the then government, were intentionally used for their selfish purposes, like cannon fodder. They are doing exactly the same thing today, conducting mobilization and sending people to slaughter. And yet, there was an opportunity for a civilized way out of the situation back then. It is known that on February 21st, an agreement was signed between the then acting president of Ukraine and the opposition. The official representatives of Germany, Poland and France acted as guarantors of the political crisis resolution. 
The agreement provided for a return to a parliamentary presidential form of government, the holding of early presidential elections, the formation of a government of national trust, as well as the withdrawal of law enforcement forces from the center of Kiev and the opposition's surrender of weapons. The Vakovna Rada passed a law excluding criminal prosecution of protest participants. Such an agreement, which allowed for the cessation of violence and the return of the situation to the constitutional field, took place. This agreement was signed, although both in Kyiv and in the West they prefer not to remember it. Today I will say more about another important fact that was not previously voiced. Literally, in those same hours, on February 21st, a conversation took place with my American counterpart at the initiative of the American side. The essence was as follows. The American leader unequivocally supported the Kiev agreement between the authorities and the opposition. Moreover, he called it a real breakthrough, a chance for the Ukrainian people to prevent the violence from crossing all conceivable boundaries. Furthermore, during the discussions, we jointly developed the following formula. Russia would try to persuade the then acting president of Ukraine to behave as restrained as possible, not to use the army and law enforcement agencies against the protesters. Accordingly, the opposition would be called to order, to free administrative buildings so that the streets would calm down. All this was supposed to create conditions for life in the country to return to normal within the constitutional and legal framework. Overall, we agreed to work together for the sake of a stable, peaceful, normal and developing Ukraine. We fully kept our word. The then president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, who actually did not plan to use the army, nevertheless did not do so. Moreover, he even withdrew additional police units from Kyiv. And what about the Western colleagues? On the night of February 22nd and throughout the following day, when President Yanukovych went to Kharkiv, where a Congress of Deputies from the southeastern regions of Ukraine and Crimea was supposed to take place. Radicals, despite all the agreements and guarantees from the West, both Europe and the USA, forcibly took control of the Rada building, the presidential administration, and seized the government. And not a single guarantor of all these political settlement agreements Neither the United States nor the Europeans lifted a finger to fulfill their obligations, to urge the opposition to release the seized administrative buildings and renounce violence. It is evident that such a course of events not only suited them, it seems that they were the authors of the development of events in this very direction. Already, on February 22, 2014, the Vakovna Rada, in violation of the Constitution of Ukraine, adopted a resolution on the so-called self-removal of the acting President Yanukovych from the presidency and scheduled early elections for May 25. That is, an armed coup provoked from outside took place. Ukrainian radicals, with the silent consent and direct support of the West, thwarted all attempts to resolve the situation peacefully. Then we urged Kyiv and Western capitals to start a dialogue with the people in southeastern Ukraine, to respect their interests, rights and freedoms. No, the regime that came to power as a result of a coup chose war. In the spring and summer of 2014, it launched punitive actions against Donbass. Russia once again called for peace. We did everything to resolve the acute problems within the framework of the Minsk agreements. But the West and the Kiev authorities, as I have already emphasized, did not intend to fulfill them. Although in words, Western colleagues, including the head of the White House, assured us that the Minsk agreements were important and that they were committed to the processes of their implementation. What, in their opinion, will allow us to get out of the situation in Ukraine, stabilize it, and take into account the interests of the residents of the East. Instead, 
they organized a blockade of Donbass. The armed forces of Ukraine consistently prepared a full-scale operation to destroy the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. The Minsk agreements were finally buried by the Kiev regime and the West. That is why, in 2022, Russia was forced to start a special military operation to stop the war in Donbass and protect peaceful residents from genocide. At the same time, from the very first days, we have been proposing options for a diplomatic resolution of the crisis. I have already mentioned this today. These are the negotiations in Belarus and Turkey, the withdrawal of troops from Kyiv to create conditions for signing the Istanbul agreements, which were in principle agreed upon by everyone. But even these attempts of ours were ultimately rejected. The West and Kyiv took a course to defeat us. But, as is known, all of this failed. Today we are making another concrete, real peace proposal. If Kyiv and the Western capitals reject it, as before, then ultimately it is their business, their political and moral responsibility for the continuation of the bloodshed. It is obvious that the realities on the ground, on the line of combat contact, will continue to change not in favor of the Kyiv regime. And the conditions for starting negotiations will be different. Let me emphasize the main point. The essence of our proposal is not about some temporary truce or ceasefire, as the West, for example, wants to restore losses, rearm the Kiev regime, and prepare it for a new offensive. I repeat, it is not about freezing the conflict, but about its final resolution. And I will say it again, as soon as Kiev agrees to the course of events proposed today, agrees to the complete withdrawal of its troops from the DPR and LPR, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions, and actually begins this process, we are ready to start negotiations without delay. I repeat, our principled position is, a neutral, non-aligned, non-nuclear status for Ukraine, its demilitarization and denazification. Moreover, everyone generally agreed on these parameters during the Istanbul negotiations in 2022. Everything was clear regarding demilitarization. Everything was outlined, the number of this and that, tanks. Everything was agreed upon. Undoubtedly, the rights, freedoms and interests of Russian-speaking citizens in Ukraine must be fully ensured. The new territorial realities, the status of Crimea, Sevastopol, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, and the Kherson and Zaporizhzhia regions, as subjects of the Russian Federation, must be recognized. In the future, all these fundamental principles should be formalized in the form of fundamental international agreements. Naturally, this also implies the lifting of all Western sanctions against Russia. I believe that Russia is offering an option that will realistically end the war in Ukraine. In other words, we call for turning a tragic page of history. Let it be difficult and gradual, step by step, but it is necessary to start restoring relations of trust and good neighborliness between Russia and Ukraine, as well as in Europe as a whole. By resolving the Ukrainian crisis, we together with our partners from the CSTO and SCO, who are already making a significant contribution to finding ways for peaceful resolution, as well as with Western, including European, states, are ready for dialogue. We could begin the fundamental task that I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, namely the creation of an indivisible system of Eurasian security that takes into account the interests of all states on the continent, without exception. Of course, a literal return to the security proposals we put forward 25 to 15 years ago, or even two years ago, is impossible. Too much has happened. Circumstances have changed. However, the basic principles, and most importantly, the very subject of the dialogue, remain unchanged. Russia recognizes its responsibility for global stability, and once again confirms its readiness to engage in discussions with all countries. But this should not be a simulation of a peace process aimed at serving someone's selfish will, someone's selfish interests, but a serious, thorough conversation on the entire range of global security issues.
Dear colleagues, I am confident that you all understand well the large-scale tasks facing Russia, how much we need to do, including in the field of foreign policy. I sincerely wish you success in this difficult work of ensuring Russia's security, our national interests, strengthening the country's positions in the world, promoting integration processes and bilateral relations with our partners. For its part, the state leadership will continue to provide the diplomatic service and all those involved in the implementation of Russia's foreign policy with the necessary support. Once again, thank you for your work, for your patience and attention to what has been said. I am confident that we will succeed together. Thank you very much. Dear Vladimir Vladimirovich, thank you very much for your assessment of our work. We are trying, and life forces us to try even harder. We will continue because everyone understands that this is necessary for the fate of the country, our people, and to some extent, for the whole world. Your directive, which you have just outlined, detailing the concept of Eurasian security, will be carried out as specifically as possible together with our colleagues from other departments. And in the context of building a new, fair, as you said, indivisible security system. We will continue to address individual crisis situations based on the same principles, among which the Ukrainian crisis holds priority for us. We will use your new initiative in various situations, including our work within BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, with the People's Republic of China, and with countries in Latin America and Africa. These countries have also put forward their initiatives, but they are still being ignored by those who govern Ukraine. Thank you again. We will continue to make efforts.